Well, welcome back, everybody, to Pushing the Limits. Today, I have a hilarious, amazing, crazy, awesome guest for you, uh, Craig Harper. Who doesn't know Craig Harper? If you're in Australia, you definitely know who the heck Craig Harper is. If you're in New Zealand, you probably know who Craig Harper is. And if you don't, you're about to find out. Welcome to the show, Craig. How are you doing? Now I feel like I've got to live up to some kind of bloody pressure, some expectation. Nobody knows me in New Zealand. Let's start. You do. You do and your mum. That's yeah. about it. Me and mum, you left quite an and, impression on my You know, my, my family and relatives and a few randoms over here know who I am. But thank you, Lisa, for having me. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, it's awesome. Now, this is going to be a bit of a hilarious show because Craig is a bit of a character. I was on Craig's show in Australia, The You Project, uh, and and it was one of the most fun podcast interviews I've had. I mean, I loved getting into the science and deep with, you know, stuff, but it was really fun to just let my hair down, so to speak, and um, rant and rave a little bit and have a bit of fun. So today, there'll be no doubt a bit of that. Craig, can you tell the ones who don't know about you, you're in uh, Melbourne or just outside Melbourne and Hampton and Victoria in Australia. Can you tell us a little bit your background, your crazy, amazing career that you have had? Um, sure. So, so I'll start with, well, may, maybe I'll go a little bit before my career because what happened before was a bit of a catalyst. So mm-hmm. um, I had a pretty good childhood, all that stuff. I won't bore the listeners, but one of the things that was part of my growing up was being a fat kid, the fattest kid in my school. So mm-hmm. Um, that became a bit of a catalyst for me to explore, you know, getting in shape and all that stuff. So when I was 14, I lost a whole lot of weight. I was um, 90 something kilos. I went down to about 60 and I started training, Wow! started running and I started doing body weight stuff. I lost about, I literally lost a third of my body weight in 15 weeks. And, um, you know, and it wasn't like I had a horrible childhood or it it was fine. Um, But I was called Jumbo all through school. That was my name. So uh, the kids call me that, parents, teachers, all of that. But believe it or not, it wasn't really a hostile or a horrible. It was, I don't know, it's because I was this big, fat, pretty happy kid, right? But anyway, so I got in shape and that led me into um, a lot of curiosity and um, exploration and investigation in fitness and nutrition. And so I started working in gyms when I was 18, had no idea what I was doing. The qualifications and the the barriers to entry then were very low. So I started working in gyms, Lisa, when I was 18, which was 1982, I'm 57. And I ended up uh, in uh, 19, uh, 1989, I think I set up the first personal training center in Australia. Wow. So lots of other things around that, but I owned PT studios for 25 years. Um, I had the biggest center in the Southern hemisphere in Brighton, a few kilometers from where I'm sitting now, which was 10,000 square feet. It was bigger than lots of commercial gyms, um, but it was just a PT center. Worked with elite athletes, worked with the AFL over here, Australian Football League, worked with St Kilda Footy Club, Melbourne Vixens in the National and the Trans-Tasman League it was then. Uh, netball league, uh, Melbourne Phoenix, uh, Nissan Motorsport, wow. a bunch of Olympians, um, <laughs> blokes in prison, um, uh, corporates, people with disability, normal people, abnormal people. I put me in the abnormal category, the atypical. <laughs> um, you know, and later on, when I didn't go to uni until I was 36 for the first time. Um, wow. I did a degree in exercise science. It was hilarious because I'd already been working with elite people as a conditioning coach and a strength coach. Um, And yeah, lots of stuff. I did radio over here for about 20 years. I started my podcast a few years ago. I did television for a few years, three years on national telly. I did, uh, I wrote for the Herald Sun, which is the main paper in Melbourne for a while. Lots of magazines. I've written a bunch of books. I've written seven, I've written nine books. I think seven or eight of them are published. I'm looking at the books on my table. I should probably know that. I can't even remember. There's so many. (laughs) Um, And you know, like, but, but really the thing that I I guess the, where we might go today, but for me was, I realized, you know, by the time I was about 19 or 20 working in gyms, I realized that um, how much I knew about bodies wasn't nearly as important as how much I understood human beings. And so while my understanding of anatomy and physiology and biomechanics and movement and energy systems and 
progressive overload and adaptation and recovery and all of those things was, it wasn't great to be honest, like I was 20, but it was yep. all right. And it improved over time. Mm. Um, but what really mattered was how well I understood human behavior, because as you and I know, we can give someone a program and direction and education and encouragement and support and resources and not knowledge and awareness and but that doesn't mean they're going to go and do the work and it definitely doesn't mean they're going to create the result and it definitely doesn't mean they're going to explore their talent or their potential and so yeah it's been so you know from when i was 18 yeah from when i was 18 till now it's just been lots of different roles and lots of different places and i guess the other main bit before I shut up was I realized when I was about 20 that I didn't like having a boss much. So <laughs> one, and, and not that got he, that in common. <laughs> yeah, my, ba- my boss was a good dude, but I thought I don't want to be like, I could do this for me. I don't need to do this for you. And so the last time I had a boss was uh, 32 years ago. So I've been working for myself since I was 25. Wow, that's that's freaking awesome! And what a what an amazing career and so many books. And I know that you're actually doing a PhD at the moment. So, what's your PhD in, and um, why did you choose this sort of a subject for the your PhD? Yeah, so my PhD is in uh, neuropsychology slash neuroscience. So I'm at um, Monash over here. There's we have a facility called Brain Park, which is cool. There's lots of cool stuff there. That's where I'm based. Um, And my research is in a thing called external self-awareness, which is understanding the you experience for others. So in other words, it's your ability to be able to understand how other people perceive and process and experience you. Wow. um, Which is a fascinating subject. Very little research on it. Um, So I'm, I've created a scale, which is to measure this, um, component of psychology or, or uh, communication or awareness um, and so I'm doing I'm putting that through the grill at the moment getting that validated um, in my I'm doing two studies the first study is um, being run kind of soon but yeah the whole research is around this thing of what's it like being around me and do I know what it's like being around me not from an insecurity point of view but from a, an awareness point of view, because when I understand, for example, the Craig experience for Lisa or for an audience I'm in front of or for the person I'm coaching or the athlete I'm working with or, or the, the drug addict, the person with addictive issues that I'm sitting with, then if, if I understand what it's like being around me, I can create greater and deeper connection. Mm-hmm. But one of the mistakes that a lot of leaders and coaches and managers and people in positions of authority make is that they assume that people just understand what they're saying or they assume that people think like them. Mm-hmm. When in reality, the only person who thinks exactly like me in the world is me. Yeah. And the only person who thinks like Lisa Tamati exactly all the time, 24 seven is Lisa, right? Yep. So when I go into a conversation or a situation or a process or a negotiation or an encounter with somebody and I assume that they think like me or understand like me or that that my intention is their experience, which is rarely the case, I'm more likely to create problems than solutions. Yeah. And you're not going to hit the nail on the head and actually get the results for with that person that you are wanting to get. Yeah. So this is a this is a real powerful thing because I mean it just made me, you know, as you were talking there, I was like, well, how do people perceive me? That's an interesting thought, you know, because you just sort of go through your daily interactions with people and you think you're a, you know, compassionate, empathetic person who gets everything and you're sort of picking up on 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 different cues and so on, but you do but then to actually think, but how is that person experiencing me? And, and I like as a coach, as I develop as a coach, you know, um, I've had problems uh, when I'm doing one on one and that I'm overwhelming people sometimes because I'm so passionate and so full of information. And I have had to and I'm still learning to to fit that to the person that I'm talking to and because I've, I, for, for me, it's like, I've got so much information. I want to fix you. <laughs> I want to yeah, help you. And, that, and you have that's this underst- like, woof. <laughs> and the yeah, person's and like, huh. <laughs> so you and I connect because we're kind of similar, right? And I love that. I love your craziness and your energy and your full onness. Um, but you and I, 
unless we are aware around some people, we will scare the fuck out of them, right? <laughs> yep. So so that's why it's important that people like, well, all of us really, not just you and I, but but that we have an awareness of what is the Lisa experience for this. Because like, let's say, for example, you've got five athletes and you want to inspire them and, and you know, get them in the zone, motivate them. And they're all in front of you. And so you give all of them in the same moment the same, and let's say they're five similar athletes in a similar, if not the same sport with a similar goal. It doesn't matter. But the reality is they're five different human beings, right? They've got five different belief systems and backgrounds and sets yep. of values and prejudice and like and emotional states. And, and so you're not talking to the same person. But when you deliver the same message to five different humans and you expect the same connection, well, you're not thinking it through. Yep. So... And of course, you can't create optimal connection with everyone all the time, but this is just part of the, what's it like? What's their experience of me like? And again, it's not about, oh, I'm insecure and I want them to like me. No, it's about, I need to understand how they perceive and process me so that I can create connection. And look, the other really interesting thing about psychology and the human experience and metacognition, thinking about thinking more broadly is that all of us think we're open-minded and objective, but none of us are. <laughs> Nobody is totally objective or open-minded because the human experience is subjective. Yeah. So yeah. even me who understands this and is doing a PhD in it and teaches it, well, people go, but aren't you objective? And I go, no, I wish <laughs> I was. And it, it's, I, I'd like to say I am because it sounds fucking great, but I'm not. And the reason that I'm not, is because wherever I go, my ego, my issues, my beliefs, my values, my limitations, my biases go with me. Yep. And, and they are the window through which I view and process the world, right? Yep. So our ego wants us to say, oh, of course I'm objective, of course I'm open-minded. But the truth is, and with some things we will be more objective and open-minded because we don't really have a pre-existing idea about it. But on a global or a broad level, you know, our stuff goes with us everywhere. And, yep. and the beginning of, without getting too deep or philosophical, but awareness, real awareness and consciousness is to first be aware of your lack of awareness. <laughs> Love it. That is, that is amazing. Yeah. You know, you can't, like, you can't overcome the thing you won't acknowledge or you can't get good at the thing you won't do, right? And so I have to go... Firstly, I'm flawed. Firstly, um, I've got as many issues as anyone that I work with. And this is not self-loathing. This is me just going, okay, so how do I do better? And this, for me, this is the process of performance, high performance, whether it's at sport, at life, um, at recovery, at relationships, at connection, at, doesn't matter. High performance is high performance. For me, high performance means getting the most out of you and your potential and your resources and your time. Yep. And so the principles that work with becoming an elite athlete, most of those principles work with building a great business, Yep. you know, which they is make decisions, over. follow through, get uncomfortable, do the work, show up, don't give up, ask great questions, persevere, roll up your sleeves, pay attention to your results, improvise, adapt, overcome. Like this is not new stuff. No, but it rolls off your tongue pretty damn well because you've been in this in this space for a long time and you know like it, it's a lot of us like you know to go into that whole um our bias and our the filter that we see the world through the lens which we look through we, we're not aware like we, a lot of the programming and this is what i you know i've had I've done a lot of work on for myself you know the programming that i got as a kid that i downloaded into my subconscious is um running the ship basically and i can as a as an educated hopefully you know wiser woman now go hang on a minute that little voice that just popped up in my head and told me oh i'm not good enough to do that is not me talking that's the program that's the program i downloaded when i was i don't know seven or eight or something and it's a product of that conditioning and i can actually go in and then and start to change that story because that, that, and I think a lot of us are just running on automatic. You know, we're still playing, 
I'll give you an example. So when my mum was a kid, she was up on stage and doing a speech at school and she froze, right? And she got laughed off the stage and, you know, as kids can be nasty. And, and so forever in a day, she was like, I will not ever speak in public again because she'd had this experience as a, what, a seven or eight year old. Um, and, and she was telling, you know, just tell me the story as a 40 something, 50 something year old. No, I'm not ever getting up in a public space because, and I'm like, but that's just, a, a, you are not that seven or eight year old now. And you can have a choice to make that changes. And she couldn't make that change until she had the aneurysm. And then she forgot all those memories. Some of those memories were gone and that inhibition was gone. And now she'll get up and talk on a stage in front of like 500 doctors. You know? Yeah, that's amazing. I love it. And what, what you, you just articulated beautifully um, the core of a lot of what I do, which is recognizing your programming and, and where does my stories or my stories finish and where do I start? Yeah. So, you know, you think about it from everyone listening to this, from, from when we could reason anything or, or process any data ar around us or understand anything from when we, I don't know, two, three months, really probably earlier, but until listening to this podcast right now, all of us have been trained and taught and told and programmed and conditioned. And then now here we are. Mm. And it's, it's being aware of that. And, and me too, everyone is like, well, my beliefs, like, like think about when did you choose your beliefs? Yeah. Uh, pretty much never. They're just <laughs> there. And they're there as a byproduct of your journey. Now, that's okay. That's not bad or good. That's normal. Well, the next question is, are all of your beliefs, um, do they serve you? Well, the answer is no. Do no. any of them sabotage you? Well, a shitload. Okay, so let's put them under the microscope. So, you know, that word that I used before, metacognition, is in, in a nutshell, thinking about thinking where, and this is where we go, hang on, let's just step out of the groundhog dayness of our existence, which you also spoke of like, and let's go hang on. Cause what, what we do on a level, we live consciously. That is, oh, I've got to think about where I'm driving and, and I've got to figure out what I'm giving the kids for dinner or what I'm getting, what time I'm training or, but really uh, on a real fundamental uh, macro level, we we live largely unconsciously yeah, because we kind of do the same shit the same way we have the same conversations even you and i know like i've been training in a gym since i was 14 that's 43 years i watch people go to the gym who always do the same fucking workout yeah <laughs> same reps same sets same treadmill same speed same inclines same boxing same everything same same intensity same workload same machines and then they say, why isn't my body changing? Yep. Well, because it doesn't need to. No, you've because given it the status quo. You're, not, yeah. you're stimulating it the same way. And, yeah. and oh, you know, that we, can that for years. we can expand <laughs> that to life. Whereas we kind of, you know, I was talking to a lady yesterday about this and, and she was telling me about a conversation she has with her son who's got some issues, who's 17. And I went, be really honest. How many times have you had a version of that conversation with him? She goes, 1,000. Wow. I go, and how's that going? <laughs> now, that might be an exaggeration, but the bottom line is, but nonetheless, despite the fact that it didn't work the first 999 times, she's Still doing it again. Doing it. <laughs> so it, it's about, and again, it's not about beating ourselves up. It's about going, well, whatever I'm doing, whether or not it's with this relationship or this training program or this habit or behavior or this business, Whatever I'm doing isn't working. So let's have a new conversation or no conversation or let's try a different tr protocol or let's change that, the way I isn't, sleep. Isn't that, that like that, that, you know, the circuitry in the brain, when you do something for the first time, it's really hard because you're, you're, you're creating a new connection in the brain. And therefore we go into these old routines and habits, even though we don't want to be doing them anymore, but we the, the groove in the brain is so well worn, that path is so, you know, those synapses have connected or whatever they do in there. And that path is so well worn that when it's, it's, it's the path of least resistance for our lazy brains and our subconscious to, to do what it does all the time. So like when you're driving a car home and you can have a conversation and be singing a song and, and, and thinking about what you're cooking for dinner and then you get to halfway into town and you realize 
hell, I can't even remember driving there, but you were doing it and you were doing it safely because it was all on that subconscious automated level. When you were first driving the car, it was a mission and it was like, oh my God, I got to change the gears and steer and keep an eye on. And it was all like overwhelmed, but then it got easier and easier and easier. And then with our, with our rituals and our habits that we develop, we make these well-worn grooves, don't we? And then we just follow the same old, same old, even though it's not getting the results that we want. And when we try and step out of our comfort zone and start doing a new habit and developing a new way, there's a lot of resistance in the brain for the first you know, few weeks, isn't there? Until you get that groove going and then it gets easier and easier and easier once you've done it a hundred times. Do you, do, you, do you, Is that what you're sort of saying here? Yeah. Is that the sort Look, of stuff? That, I mean, that's perfect. I mean, you nailed it. Look, the thing is that, Everything that we do for the first time, for most of us, nearly everything, unless we've done something very similar before, but it's hard. Mm, and so, scary. you know, I always say everyone starts as a white belt. <laughs> you know, in the dojo, you start as a white belt. Yeah. When, as an ultramarathon, if I went, Lisa, I'm, which I wouldn't, but if I went, oh, I'm going to run an ultramarathon. Well, if I started training today, metaphorically today, I'm a white belt. Yeah. Um, I'm a black belt at other stuff. Yeah. Uh, I'm a green belt. I'm a yellow belt. Depends what I'm doing. Depends what, you know, I'm not bad talking to audiences. That's, I should be pretty good at it. I've done it a million times, <laughs> but take me to yoga and I'll hide in the corner because I'm as flexible as a fucking ceramic tile. I'm a white <laughs> belt, right? <laughs> you know, but put me in the gym lifting weights. I go, okay. Right. And, yeah. and so again, this is all just about awareness and development and ownership and look, the thing too is that you're right. Everything is very, um, you know, we do create not only neural grooves, patterns, um, but also behavioral and emotional and cognitive grooves too, where we, we, we're very comfortable in this space. Mm -hmm. And one of the challenges for us, it's like, it's, it's a dichotomy because if, if everyone listening to this could somehow be involved and put up a show of hands and we said, all right, everyone, um, how many of you want to change uh, something about your life or your outcomes or your situation or your body or your operating system or your current life experience? Nearly everyone's going to put up their hand yep. for something, right? Something. Um, then if you said, all right, now at the same time, be brutally honest with yourself, how many of you like being comfortable? everyone's going to put up their hand. <laughs> so the problem is on the one hand, we say, I want to be strong and resilient and amazing and produce great results and do great shit and grow and develop my potential and fucking kill it. And, uh, but I don't want to get uncomfortable. Well, good luck princess. That isn't working. It doesn't work. The world's a bitch really, isn't it? I mean, like, well, it, it how is can you get strong with it? How can you get strong you without working resistance. against resistance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you then can't. this is just uh on my boxing gym, there was a, a saying on the wall, strength comes from struggle. And it's just like, oh, damn, that's so right. You know, like it's not what we always want. And I wish sometimes that the world was made another way. But we, we constantly need to be pushing up against what hurts, mm. what is uncomfortable, it's painful. You know, just from a biology point of view, being in the thermonuclear range, you know, being nice and comfortably warm and, and and cozy is is really bad for us if we're in that all the time we need to go into an ice bath or cold water or go surfing or something and get cold we need to be hot go into a sauna and all when you do these things outside of those comfort zones we need to lift weights in order to build stronger muscles we need to do uh fasting in order to have autophagy we need you know we all of these things are the stuff that is outside of pleasant and you better get used to that idea. It's not mm. because I want to be like masochistic in my approach to life, but it's just that the way that the world works, if you sit on your ass being comfortable eating chips all day, watching Netflix, you're not going to get the results that you're looking for. That's right. And also there's this, um, you know, because we only live in the moment and, and because we are, and I'm generalizing and I'm sure a lot of your listeners are, are not what I'm about to describe, mm. But because many of us are very instant gratification based, yeah, right? It's like the story is I'll eat this, I'll do this, I'll avoid that, but I'll start tomorrow or I'll start Monday or I'll start January 1. And that goes on for 15 years, right? Mm. Yep. And, and now I've backed myself into <laughs> a health, 
yep. an emotional and a psychological and a physiological corner that's hard to get out of because now I'm 49 and my body's kind of fucked and I've got high blood pressure and I've got all these issues because I've been avoiding and denying and delaying and lying to myself for a long time. Again, this is not everyone, so please don't get offended. And it's but not a judgment. It's just no, the way but this it goes. Is, I mean, this is you what know? happens. Like we live in this world where you can't say the truth. Yep. And, and I'm not talking about being insensitive or moral judgments on people. But the thing is, it's like when I talk about being fat, I talk about myself because then no one can get injured, uh, yep. injured, uh, insulted, insulted or yep. offended, right? So, you know, when I was fat, I wasn't thick set or full figured or voluptuous or stocky. I was fucking <laughs> fat, right? Yeah. And But I was fat because of my choices and behaviours. Yep. Now, there are lots of variables around that, but yes. at some stage we have to say, um, and again, there are people with genetics that make stuff difficult for oh, them, absolutely. medical conditions and all that. We fully acknowledge that. But at some stage we need to go, all right, well, I'm making decisions and doing things which are actually destroying me. Yep. They're actually hurting me. You know, and this is, this is just about ownership and awareness. Yep. You know, and my, like the biggest challenge in my life is me. The biggest problem in my life is me. Yep. Like the only person that can ever really get in my way is me, yep. you know, but also yep. I'm the solution to me. And, and you, if you, I think it's a willingness to work on it. And, um, you know, like I've, I've looked into, you know, addictions and things quite a lot too, because I know that I have an addictive personality trait, you know, I have genetics that are predisposed to that. And, and I do everything obsessively. So whether that's running for like a billion kilometers or whether that's running, you know, five companies or whether that's whatever I'm doing, I'm doing like an extreme version of that because it's just like, you know, have that type of personality. And it is genetics. And I find that that's why the study of genetics for me is so interesting. There's a lot of predisposition in there. However, that does not negate the fact that I can still make choices and I can turn the ship around and I need to be aware of those predispositions. Just like, you know, mum's got some predispositions towards cardiovascular disease and putting on weight very easily. Um, that's just a fact of life for her. And it's not pleasant and compared to, you know, to, to other genetics types it's a bit of a disadvantage however it is a fact and therefore she can still make the right choices for her body and this is why like working in the genetic space is really really powerful because then I can say well it's not my fault that my genes are like this but they are what they are and we can remove some of the judgment on ourselves because I think when we if we're judging ourselves uh, all the time that's not helpful either because that's we're like, oh, well, I'm just useless and then I'm never going to do anything rather than empowering and say, well, it is what it is. The genes that I've been given are these. Um, the environment that I'm exposed to is this. The advertising and all that sort of stuff that's coming at us with McDonald's on every street corner and all of that sort of stuff, uh, I can't influence that. And what I can influence is I, I can educate myself and I can start to make better choices for my particular body and, and start taking ownership of that, that process and not just going, well, it's not my fault that I'm bigger boned. You may be bigger boned or bigger, have genetics that are all about conservation. But there you need to be doubly careful and, and, and put in the education and the time and the work. And the, I think it's about taking ownership and not, not judging yourself, but getting on with the job. Like I know, like I know my own personal and I, you know, um, what did you say to me the first time I met you? Something that was real self-aware anyway. It was self-deprecating and it was self-aware. I can't remember what it was that you said. And I went, it, there's a man who knows his own weakness and is working on it, you know? And, and, and I think that's really key. Like, I, I know what I'm shit at. And, and that's not self-loathing. That's self-awareness. No. And, no. and here's the thing, we're all about learning and growing and I love my life and I, you know, I'm aware that I've got some skills and gifts. I'm also aware that I've got lots of flaws and shit I need to work on and, mm. you know, and for some Same. people that's part of, you know, um, just the journey. For other people, they are in a bit of a groundhog day. I always say if you're in a bit of a groundhog day but you're happy, then stay there because don't change because this is how I you know, don't be like me, for God's sake, be like you. But if being like you, if your normal operating system equals anxiety and sleeplessness and a bit of depression and a bit of disconnection and, and 
you know, and I'm not talking purely about mental health here. I'm just talking about that state that we all get in, which is a bit like, fuck, I don't love my life. This wasn't where I thought I would be. Yeah. Then maybe start to work consciously on and acknowledge there's some things that you can't change, some you can. And literally what you were talking about a minute ago, which is, you know, literally, okay, so there's what I've got, which is I've got these genetics, I've got 24 hours in a day, I'm 57. Uh, I've got this, these are the things I have, then there's what I do with it all. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm an endomorph, I walk past a donut, my ass gets bigger, that's my <laughs> body type, right? So I need to go, all right, well, with these or with this disposition, how do I manage optimally with 24 hours in a day with You've my done values right by and the looks beliefs? Of you, Craig. How do I manage my 24 hours optimally? Yeah. How do I, you know, it's like I, I eat two meals a day. I don't recommend anyone else does that. But for me, I don't, for even though I'm, it's great. 85, I'm an 85 kilo dude with a bit of muscle, I don't need much food. Like yep. I would love to eat all the fucking food because I love food. Yeah. But what happens when I eat what I want versus what I need is I get fat. So I differentiate between what does my body need to be lean, strong, functional, healthy versus what does Craig the fucking ex-fat kid want to inhale? Yeah. Because, and you know, and the other thing too, and this is probably a bit irrelevant, maybe relevant though for a lot of people, like, I would say of the people that I've worked with, Lisa, over the years, which is, you know, thousands and thousands, thousands yeah. I would say most people, including me, have a relationship with food that's somewhere on the scale between a little bit um, disordered and an eating disorder, right? Yep. And a little bit, not always I'll put great. I'll my hand but, up there. It's yeah, not that, but at the other <laughs> end of the scale, I'm a fucking lunatic around food, right? Now... <laughs> You're educated, I'm educated, but I tell people all the time. So if I was an addict, and by the way, I've never drunk, never smoked, never done drugs. But if I had have started drugs or alcohol, I would have probably done it uh, well. drunk and used <laughs> for Australia, right? I probably would have been a champion because I'm like you, I'm addictive. Now, my addiction is food. So, you know, people think, but you're educated, but you're, th you're that. It doesn't matter. Like I still need, want that pie. <laughs> I need to manage myself. For you. <laughs> yeah, I need to manage myself around yeah. food Daily. because if I open the cheesecake door, get out of the fucking way. Yeah, right. Yeah, I hear you. If I open certain doors, that that derails me. So yeah. I need to know, and this is the same with everybody. And and you know, it's like we all have a relationship with food. Okay, is yours good or bad? Healthy or unhealthy? Don't overthink it. Just be real. We all have a relationship with our body. How's that going? We all have a relationship with exercise, activity, and movement. How's that going? We all have a relationship with money. We all have a relationship with our ego. You know, it's like this is opening the door on self-awareness and self-management yeah, to it. a new level. Yeah, and this is going to be a fascinating PhD. I really, I, I, I can't wait to to find out a bit more about it. And and I think, yeah, just having that self-awareness, like I like I will freely say, like I've struggled with my body image and who I am and am I acceptable? And I was always trying to be the skinny little model girl when I was young and as gymnast and, you know, as a kid. And so struggled immensely with body image issues. And people look at me now and they go, oh, whatever, you're, you know, you're, you're lean and you're, you're, you're fit, obviously, and you don't ever, you, you wouldn't understand. Oh, you have no idea how much I understand. And this is still a constant daily battle. Even though I'm educated, even though I know exactly what I should be and shouldn't be doing, I don't always succeed against my, um, you know, that inner sort of drive that sometimes when you get out of balance, and this is why for me, like keeping myself and when I say in balance, I mean like keeping my neurotransmitters under wraps, you know, like in a, in a nice ordered fashion because I have a tendency to dopamine and adrenaline being my dominant uh, hormones, right? So I'm just like, go, go, go to your absolute blow, take, jump in, risk, don't think about it, do, you know, go and then burn out crash mm. bang and so mm. i need to i need to have constant movement i need to do the you know meditation thing regularly like before this podcast i took five minutes to get my brain back into this 
to the space because I wanted to do a good interview and I wasn't going to do that in the stressed out bloody I'd been doing too much admin work for 10 hours you know so I, mm. I know how to manage those things and I, it's the management on a everyday basis that I think and having those tools in your toolkit so that you know how to pull out. Oh, mom, I can feel my adrenaline going. I can feel the anger rising. I better go for a sprint out to the letterbox and back, you mm. know, whatever mm. it takes. Mm. Does that resonate with you? Yeah, hundred percent. You know, what's interesting is um, I've been around, um, you know, uh, I worked, one of the things I didn't mention, I worked at a drug and alcohol rehabilitation center for three mm -hmm. years, just as, as their kind of, uh, was my title bloody health something manager something but I, I would only work there one day a week with them but work with lots of addicts and alcoholics and also you know athletes and all these things but the thing is uh, especially with athletes athletes tend to get their sense of self and their identity from their performances yep and not all but a lot mm. and which is why i've known many athletes who got retired mm. uh broke, earlier than they down. thought and well, they, they went into straight away, most of them, a depression or form of depression. Mm. And so this is a really interesting thing to just talk about briefly is, you know, I, from a happiness and a wellness and a cognitive function and a, uh, you know, mental health, emotional health point of view is to think about where you get your identity and sense of self from. Now, one of the challenges for us is we live in a culture which is very much externally focused. So who totally. you are, Lisa, who you are is what you have and what you own and what you wear and what you look like yeah. and what people think of you and your brand and your performance and your outcome, all things, you know, your, your shit. And I grew up in that because I was an insecure fucking fat kid who became an insecure muscly bloke. <laughs> and then I woke up one day, I was 30 and I was huge and I had muscles on my eyelids and veins everywhere. <laughs> and all I was was just a bigger, more insecure version of what I used to be. Because I was still a fuckwit just in a bigger body, right? <laughs> because I wasn't dealing with the issues because my problem wasn't my biceps or deltoids aren't big. My problem is I'm mentally and emotionally bankrupt and perhaps spiritually depending on your belief system. And so we get taught from an early age that who you are essentially is about all things external. So we get taught directly or indirectly that self-esteem and self-worth and identity is an outside-in process. My theory is that it is the other way around. It yep. is an inside-out journey. It is, it's differentiating between who I am and my stuff and recognizing that everything that I have and own and earn and do and you know, my profile and my podcast and my results and my yep. brand and my house and my biceps and all those physical, external, observable things don't matter nearly as much from a mental and emotional health point of view as what is happening internally. Yep. And so, and I'll shut up after this, but no, that's brilliant. This, is, this is cool, not because I'm sharing it, just this idea is cool, is the, is the duality of the human experience and what that means is that we live in two worlds. So where we do life is in this physical external place of situation, circumstance, environment, traffic lights, other humans, government, COVID, weather, yeah. runners, running, sport, all that external stuff, which is not bad. It's awesome. But that's where we do life. But where we do our living, where we do living is that inner space of feelings and ideas and creativity and passion and fear and depression and anxiety and hope and joy and overthinking and self-doubt and self-loathing and excitement and creativity, you know? Wow. And it's trying to understand, because you and I know at least a few people, maybe many, who from the outside looking in, their life is fucking amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the Hollywood life. It's, it's so their life from like the outside that. is shiny. Yeah. But I've, I've coached many of those people, trained them, work with them, sat with them, and not all, of course, some are great. But there are many people who from the outside looking in, you would go, oh, they're really successful. That would be the label that we use in our culture. Yeah. Why are they successful? Oh, look at all of their stuff. Yeah. All of that stuff, their those outcomes, that house. Yeah. That equals that money, that equals success. But when you sit and you talk to that person, you go, oh, 
this successful person doesn't sleep much. This per person needs to medicate to sleep and also for anxiety and also for depression. And also they hate themselves and also they feel disconnected yep. and also they're lonely. Um, and or if not all of that, some of that, if not all the time, some of the time, and you go, oh, the outside and the inside don't align. Yep. And so it's going... And by the way, of course, there's nothing wrong with building a great business and writing five books and being an awesome runner um, or, or whatever, building an empire. That's not bad, but it's not healthy when that's the totality of who we are. Yeah. And, and spending time on the inside and being okay with who you are. Because I often ask myself this question, um, what if it was all taken away from me again? You know, and I've lost, you know, I went through my 30s, lost everything, had to start back from scratch. You know, I've been there, done that. I've you know, had to had to go through the the ringer a couple of times. If everything was taken off me, my house, my achievements, my business, um, which could happen tomorrow, you know, um, who am I, and would I be able to get back up again? And I reckon I would, because I've got tools to rebuild, and yeah. I know that resilience is the is the most important thing. The question I ask myself sometimes, though, is uh, when, you know, like I, I lost my father this year, uh, last year, um, sorry, six months ago or so, um, that knocked the crap out of me. 100%. Out of my resilience, because that was like, up until that point, it didn't matter if I lost, a, you know, my job, my car, my career, uh, anything else but my, my family were safe and they were all alive, then that's all I needed, you know? And, and then when the chief gets taken out, the, the cornerstone who'd been a rock, you know, my mum is too, but, you know, that was a cornerstone. Then it, did, it was a bit of an existential bloody crisis for me because it was like, and, and now life is never going to be the same again and that resilience, and I really had to dig deep to stand back up again, you know? Mm. And, and I think, so grief is one of those things. So I ask myself constantly, and one of the reasons I drive myself so hard is to protect my family, mm. you know, uh, and to look after them and make sure I don't miss anything. And it's but one look, of the things I study so hard for. And, and I, just sharing a personal story to, to sort of get people to understand, you know, if you lost everything, could you get back up? What would it, what would it take to break you? You know, mm. that nearly broke me. Mm. You know, I'll be, I'll be brutally honest. Well, I, I say to people who are in a bit of a, and thanks for sharing that. And, you know, sorry about your dad. God bless him. Yeah. You know, we, oh, um, shit. you know, like I say to people, okay, let's forget all the fucking KPIs and the wah, wah, wah and success <laughs> mantras and, you know, all right, that's good. I can stand in front of people and motivate and inspire and make them laugh and tell stories and be, that's all good too. Yeah, you're maybe. brilliant. But I go, I've got three words for you. One question, three words. And the three words and the one question are what really matters. Mm. And what really matters is not your fucking telly. It's not your bank balance. It's not your biceps. It's not your hair color. It's not your fucking lippy. Or it's, you know, in my case, it's not your abs or, you know, and none of those things of themselves are bad. But I, I've, you know, I've been really lucky that I've worked with people who are in a really bad way, people in prison, Yep. Um, uh, who got themselves there, of course, but then probably more um, impact for me was, you know, people with really bad injuries. Mm. I work with a bloke at the Disability. moment, a mate of mine who got blown up in an accident. I yeah. train him three days a week and he was literally given zero chance of living like um, or, or having any function similar to your mum. Wow. And he started, um, he was in, like your mum, he was in a coma. Uh, I started, they said he'd be a quadriplegic if he, they firstly they said he wouldn't live and he lived and they were like they were mesmerized how that happened. Yeah. Got through the operations. He got blown up by gas bottles which were in the back of his ute while he was driving. Oh my they God. blew the car apart. They blew the roof off. They shattered windows for 800 meters in the houses. Oh my God. Um, and he was given zero chance of living. And he was in coma for a long time. And I would go in and talk to him and, you know, um, when he obviously was not awake and all, all the stuff that you did. And I'd just say to him, they don't know. Like they'd be going, yes, they you know, no I go, mate, they are. don't know. I go, they're <laughs> guessing. They don't know. I'm like, just get well enough to get out of here and I'll start training you. And exactly. I started training him 
I started training him in a wheelchair with a broomstick. And so, and the broomstick literally weighed, I don't know, maybe a hundred grams. And so I would put the broomstick in his hands and I would pull his hands away. So his arms away from his yep. body. Yep. And I'd say, now try and pull that towards you. Yep. And that's where we started yep. and with a hundred gram broomstick. Yeah. Now it's three and a bit years later. I've trained him for three and a bit years. Wow. He's now walking with sticks. He drives himself to the gym. His Far brain out. function is fucking amazing. Oh my he's still God. in const he's still in constant pain and he's got a lot of issues. But the bottom line is the dude who they went, you will never do never this. walk. You'll never you talk. There'll never, never be survive. any you, you'll never have any function, right? Yep. So these are my two big um perspective givers that's one and the other one is so what a november <laughs> what's that what a legend yeah he's amazing he's amazing so about 14 months ago i was at the gym and i was training with my training partner who's like me he's an old buffet he's in good shape he's you know he's fit he doesn't drink doesn't smoke him and i are very similar anyway one of the stupid things that he does is he takes I don't want to get in trouble, but he takes pre-workout. Doesn't doesn't do yep. drugs, doesn't do anything. I don't know. But anyway, I took a pre-workout. We're training and he's doing a set of chins. And he did 30 chins, Lisa, and he held his breath for the whole time because that's what he does. He thinks he gets more reps when he holds his breath. By the way, folks, not a great plan, right? <laughs> holds his rep, holds his breath for 30 reps. He's comes training down. his chemo receptors, that's for sure. Yeah, comes down. <laughs> falls on his face on the floor and I think he's having a, a seizure. Oh. And it had a an instant cardiac arrest. Oh, my God. So not a heart attack, a cardiac arrest. So, so just heart, heart stopped. So I, it took me, you know, kind of 20 seconds to realise it was that and not, you know, and there was, I won't describe what was going on with him. Yep. But as you can imagine turning yep. all kinds of colours, stuff yep. coming out of his mouth that was messy, yeah. right? Yep. So he was dead for 17 minutes. And oh, I worked, my God. I worked on him for 10 until the ambos got there or the paramedics, and God bless them, they are freaking amazing. But what's interesting is in that, firstly, that 17 minutes could have been 17 days. That's how clearly I remember those minutes. Yeah. And I'm on the floor kneeling down next to one of my best friends in the world. Yep. And I'm I'm doing compressions and breathing and I'm trying to save his life. Yeah. And it's funny how in that moment everything comes without even trying to everything comes screamingly into perspective about what is bullshit. Yes. What matters? Yes. What fucking doesn't matter? Yes. What I waste energy and attention on. And literally those 17 minutes, I mean, I think I, I had you. pretty good awareness, but they really changed me. Yeah, yep, I hear I you. went, you know, it's it's wow. nothing nothing matters except the people I love. Exactly. I'll figure the, I'll figure the rest out. Yep. And, uh, you know. It, it, it's, a, it's an amazing story. Did he survive? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is We're training it. Right? We're, it's, it's five to two here in... And he's waiting Melbourne. for you. We're training at five. <laughs> Brilliant. And Say hi for me. He's still an idiot. He's awesome. He's, lucky he's, he's still got an you. idiot, but at <laughs> least he breathes when he chins. <laughs> yeah, but, 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 you know, like just to, um, you know, the experience I went through with my dad, um, and I haven't done a whole uh, podcast on it yet, and I, and I intend to because um, the, the two weeks fighting for his life in the hospital and fighting up against a system that wouldn't let me do intravenous vitamin C in that case that I was trying to because he had sepsis and fighting with every ounce of my body and every ounce of my will. And, 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 that, and for those, you know, it was 15 days that, that we were there and they all blend into one because, you know, there was hardly any sleep happening in that time, a couple of hours here and there when I'd fall over. Um, but the, the that, that that changed me forever, you know. And 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 the fact that because I'm a fixer, I like to fix things and people. And when we're in the fight, I'm the best person you want in your corner of the ring. If yeah. you if we're in a fight for your life, or you know, not as in like I'm a you know um, paramedic, but if you if you want someone to to fight for you, then. <laughs> 
I'm your best person to have in your corner. But when we lost that battle, man, yeah. I was broken. Yeah. And and to actually not to come out the other side and to to have that 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 win and to get him back and to save his life, especially knowing I had something that could have saved his life had I been able to give it to him from day one. And you know, you know, you know, you said that about your friend uh, who who got blown up, and you said, "Just get out of here, mate, and I'll take it from there." And that's what I was saying to my dad in his ear. You just get yourself, you just hang in there, dad, because I, you know, I will do what I can do here, and I've got, but I've got all my mates and my doctors and my scientists all lined up, ready to go. As soon as I can get you the hell out of this place, mm. I will do whatever it takes to get you back. You know, mm. but I could not do anything in a critical care situation mm. because. I had no control over him, his body, what went into him. And it, it was a, you know, he was on a, a ventilator and so on. And so I, that was out of my control, you know, mm, and mm. that's freaking devastating. Yeah. To, to, yeah. To, to know that and to feel that. Um, and how, did it does. that how did that change you? Like, how did that change you in it's, terms of? It's yeah, still you know, an evolving process, I think, Craig. Yeah. And, you know, there's a burning desire in me to get that changed in our ICUs for starters, mm -hmm. to get recognition for um, intravenous vitamin C, which I've done like a five-part series on on my podcast for starters, but I'm working on other ideas and projects for that because we're talking thousands and thousands of doctors and scientists who have the proof that this helps for things like sepsis, like ARDS, like pneumonia, and it's just being ignored. And it's, we're just 20 years behind. And this is one of the reasons I do what I do is because I know that the information, like going through that journey with my mum too, um, the information, the latest in clinical studies, all of what the scientists are doing now and what's actually happening in clinical practice are just worlds apart. And there's like a 20 year delay in from there to there. And the scientists are saying this and the doctors at the cutting edge are saying this. And so things have to change. So that's changed me in a perspective because I've never been a political person. You know, I don't want to really get, I love being in the positive world of change and let's, you know, do things. Mm. But I do feel myself going into this activism space in a, in a, in a little way because I need to um, get some changes happening and some systematic things. And, I, you know, you're up against a big buddy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a big beast to take on. Um but I'll do what I can in my corner of the world, at least, you know, awesome. uh, and, but it has awesome. changed. And all that matters to me now is my family and my mm. friends. And then from a legacy perspective is impacting the world massively with what I do know and the connections that I do have and bringing information like we've been sharing today and these very mm. personal, real stories mm. to people's ears because it, it changes the way people have their own conversations and, and start to think. Well, I think also, and thanks for sharing that. That's it. You know, somebody's got to step up, and you're mm. stepping up. And and quite often, the things that we need to do to live our values are not the things we want to do. No, it's scary. It's like fuck this. I'd yeah, I'd rather watch Netflix too. Mm. But that's not what I'm about. You know, so it's good that you recognise that and you step into that. But I think, you know, what's encouraging about this conversation for everyone um, is that. You know, neither of us, uh, well, I was going to say particularly special, you're quite special with what you do. But no. even with what you do as an elite athlete, really, you've just put in an inordinate amount of work. You know, like you've done all of the things required to become elite and to become an exception. But in many other ways, like with me, you've got issues and bullshit oh, and flaws. And, and and that's why I think, you know, I'm not saying this is a great podcast by any means, but or, or this is a great conversation because that's very fucking self-indulgent. But what I mean <laughs> is I think people connect with podcast conversations that are just that. Yeah. Where it's not like two people who are, oh, yeah, scripting. you know, just shooting off like experts. It's like... Yeah, we're both figuring it out too. Yeah. And by the absolutely. way, I'm a dickhead too. By the way, I don't know. I've get a lot of shit wrong. Don't worry about that. It's like I'm just having my best guess. I you know, and I always say, even as a coach, I've never changed anyone. All I've done is influenced people, but I've never done the work for them. They've always done the work. So yeah. everyone that I've coached that succeeded 
it's because they did the work. Like yeah. I didn't run the race. I didn't lift the weight. I didn't, I didn't play the sport. I didn't go to the Olympics. I didn't walk out onto the arena. I didn't do anything. I'm just the guy going, fuck, come on, you can do it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, and like and here's a plan and info. here's, yeah. you know, it's like I'm just the theory guy. I don't put it into, the only life that I put it into practice in is my own. Yeah. And, but that's powerful and as a role model too. I mean, you know, the shape that you're in and the stuff that you do and the, the you walk the talk. And those are the people that I want to listen to. And those are the people that I want to learn from. Well, my dad, my dad used to say to me, um, a couple of my dad's like a, a cranky philosopher, <laughs> but he used to say to me a couple of things. This is irrelevant, the first one, but he'd say, um, you can't go to university and get a personality, right? Which was funny because <laughs> my dad's like, fucking university, it's overrated. <laughs> I, I agree, Dad. Uh, yeah. Second thing. Okay. Second thing. <laughs> um, For most he used, things, <laughs> he used to say he wouldn't trust accountants or financial planners who weren't rich. Right? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> well, why would I listen to? Overweight. I remember him <laughs> saying to me, like a friend of his. No disrespect to Toyota, but or not a friend, but a dude he knew. He was a financial planner or an accountant, and he used to drive this old beaten up Corolla. And my dad's like, why would I listen to him? <laughs> like, what, look what he drives. Like, if he knew anything about making money or maximizing whatever, you know, so yeah, yeah. I, th I think the He's thing is, that, He's got well, a when, I, when I listen to somebody like you, apart from being an elite athlete, what I know is that you know, it's not like you've been given this gift and you've just milked the gift. No, you've no. obviously got a talent and a gift, but also what you've do, done is maximize everything around that from nutrition and sleep and supplements and you know, recovery and decision-making and, you know, periodization and planning and prep and, you know. Yeah, I was like hopeless in all those things for a long done, period of it. You've done all the work around, like a lot of people are gifted but don't do anything with it. Like a lot of people have got potential. Oh, huge, huge. You know, and I had no potential. I had no talent. I really didn't and I still don't. And uh, But I did have that that just persistence and I think one of the biggest things in life is persistence you know like, and, and not not expecting like oh I had a um so I'm doing this um anti-aging supplements that I've got coming in that I'm importing into the country called NMN they're, they're amazing I've looked into the science I know what I'm talking about I know these things are good right I get a client they had they stay taking the supplements for three days and then they're like Oh, it's not working. <laughs> I'm like, that sort of sums up a lot of people's approach to fitness and health. Yeah. They're looking for the pill that does it in three days. They're looking for that one workout that's going to change them and they're going to look like it's going to happen. Instead of the fact that it's a multi pronged approach, you have to chuck a whole lot of mud at the wall to get some of it to stick and you have to keep throwing it for, for forever. <laughs> not just one it's a it's a constant persistence that that sees success i mean that was definitely with your mate that had that got blown up and with mum it, it wasn't one uh one therapy that got him there it wasn't mm. one therapy that got mum where she is it mm. was this and plus that plus this plus that and then we went backwards here and then we tried that and that was a dead end and that wasn't too good uh but overall we kept going and at the end of the day success mm. you know and then ongoing work always. well i i always say to people i don't care what you get done when you're motivated i get i care what you get done when you're not motivated because yeah. everyone's a fucking champion when they're in the zone yeah but it's about your ability to persevere persist do the work it's, you know, um, it's how, how effective and proactive and productive you can be when you're not inspired. Mm. Because, you know, the problem is that a lot of us rely on this state of motivation. And in, in this sense, I'm talking about that emotional state, excitement, arousal, yeah. you know, I'm in the zone, I'm like, oh, you right, know, whatever right. I heard, Lisa, I heard Lisa talk and I was pumped, but the next day I wasn't pumped. So I didn't do it. Mm. So, you know, there's this, and it's, it's interesting because I get pigeonholed in corporate as a motivational speaker. And one yeah, of the first things I say is that motivation doesn't work. Yeah. And people look with dismay, but aren't you a motivation? I go, <laughs> look, you might get inspired or motivated while I'm here. And if that happens, that's cool. But what I actually care about is what you do. 
I care about your behaviors, your choices, and your ability to keep doing what success demands when you can't be stuffed. Because that's more important than me inspiring you for an hour or a day. Yep. Because everyone can get, you know, which is why, um, you know, everyone makes a decision, or not everyone, but a lot of people start a New Year's resolution with this whole story and whatever. And it's like, well, January 1's the day and that's just a story. January 3 is too late and December 28 is too early, <laughs> you know, because, and it all, this is all bullshit psychology. It's yeah. got, and, but we think that magically it's got something to do with a day or a date. Well, no, it's got everything to do with you and nothing to do with the calendar. Yeah. It's everything to do with, do you really want to do that thing? Because that thing you want to do is hard and uncomfortable and inconvenient and uncertain. And it probably won't be fun, quick, easy, or painless, the journey. And very expensive so, often as well along the way. That's right. And yep. so with all of that in mind, do you still want to do this thing? Yeah. Yep. And the answer is, nah, most yeah. of the time. And are you willing to put in the work? Like when, every time you take on a project, every time you do something, it mm. is going to set you, you, it's going to cost you somewhere else in your life. So you, you, you have to decide. Like a lot of people say, well, why aren't you doing ultras anymore? Because I've got other priorities. Mm. And I'm, you know, uh, I could be a, a selfish person and carry on doing the same old, same old and not be learning and developing anymore. Or I can be doing something that's actually going to benefit my family, my, 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 my audience, my crew, uh, me, um, in another way you know and it's that's more beneficial oh but don't you miss it no no mm. i don't mm. i've been there done that that was that time and this is this time you know and i think uh having that that confidence to say that took a couple of years to say that yeah and to be okay with that but i think that that's an important thing too you know well for me that's maturity and growth you know and so what will work for you you know what worked for me when i was 30 in terms of what I was doing, lifestyle work, it, and it was awesome, but it didn't work for me when I was 40. No. And it doesn't work, for, and, and it's not good or bad, we just change. And, you know, I've, you know, what I do now, like for example, what works for me, which is working independently, having a recording studio at home, I've got two offices at home, upstairs I've got an office, outside I've got an office called the Zen Den, so <laughs> internal and external. Um, and the way that I work, which is, you know, no holiday pay, no sick pay, no guarantees. I don't know how much I'm going to make this year. Yep. I don't know what bookings I'm going to get. Fuck, yep. I don't, there's so much uncertainty. Yep. <laughs> Most people would hate my life, but I fucking love it. So yep. it's trying to figure out what's my best operating system based on me, yep. my values, what I love, what I want to do, be, create and bring to the world how do I want to serve? How do I want to show up? What do I want to be? You know, and, and how do I live my truth? And how do I live my purpose? And how do I live my values? And how do I walk the talk? And yeah, I'm going to stuff up. And, but, and then based on all of that, what does my operating system need to be? You know, yeah. and once we start to get, you know, we talk about this idea a lot in self-help and whatever about, you know, living in alignment. I get asked a lot what that means. And for me, all it means is living your values. That's it. Yep. What yep. are your values? Create an operating system that reflects those values. You're in alignment. Yeah. And, you know, it is like as entrepreneurs, we're both in that same sort of space. We're creating our own world, doing this podcast, for example. Um, it, it is, you, you have to be pretty brave and courageous and sometimes stupid, um, you know, because it's a scary road out there, but I wouldn't have it any other way. And I, and I can't work for anybody else. So I think there's a bit of a, you know, rebellious spirit in there that just doesn't want to be told what to do. <laughs> so I like to run my own ship. And sometimes that ship has sunk along the way. <laughs> and sometimes it's been very successful. Um, and so you just, you just have to, but you're living, like I just could not live in a, in a corporate setting, like my dad wanted me to be an accountant. Oh my God, I would have died as an accountant. I would have been long dead because I yeah. would have just not wanted to live if that was my life. And no, no offense to accountants or anything. <laughs> Great profession. We need them, but not for me, you know, and I had to be my own person and run my own ship. And, yeah. you know, that's hard sometimes, you know, it would be, I, I sometimes think, God, it'd be a hell of a lot easier to go and work for someone else. And you, the hours I have to do and the amount of work I have to do and the mistakes that I've made and the money I've lost and the, the education I've had to invest in and the years and years of development, but, oh man, I wouldn't have it any other way, you know? Mm. Yeah. That's because for you, it's not about money. 
money's one of the things, but if, if someone said to me, Craig, you can make twice the money, but you've got to drive to work, sit in a cubicle yeah. and do ABC, yeah. Yeah. you'll make double the money. I'd be like, mm-hmm. not, not only am I not interested, I wouldn't, even, I wouldn't even give that one second of consideration. Me neither. Because for me, it's about my life experience. If my costs are covered, other than that, I'm good. Yep. As long as when it's, yeah. You know, like I live the cheapest life of all time. I literally drive a $20,000 Suzuki. I spend 23 hours a day in in bare feet. (laughs) I walk around in $10 $10 (laughs) shorts. I go to the gym every day. All I do is talk to people and think about the meaning of life and do my research. And my (laughs) life is fucking awesome. Yeah. Like I don't, I don't need more stuff. Like we, we tell ourselves this story about all the shit we need. You don't need it. You don't need the fancy watches and the fancy clothes. And you I know. used to do it. I tried it. I always say to people, I tried being selfish. I gave it a really good go for a long time. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> and and the simple life. I mean, I you know some yeah, if you if 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 that's what floats your boat, then cool. You know, have all that stuff. But for me, yeah, it's, it's a you know, um, I've got sponsored clothes. I've got you know, a two thousand dollar car. I don't care. It gets yeah. me from A to B as long as it doesn't break down. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it's not where my values lie. It's no. not who I am as a person. And if you are judging, you know, how successful I am by the car I drive, well, she's, I'm not doing too well. <laughs> well that's, I mean, but exactly. But people know who you are beyond what you drive or what you own. You know, it's like the, the prize is you. Like you're, you're amazing. Your shit's amazing. Your, your message, your well, inspiration, your energy. It is. It's amazing. Like you're great. And I'm not pissing in your pocket. You're great. I've told a hundred people about you, you know, so. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Yeah, no, you're awesome. I love it. Uh, and, and likewise. And I think, you know, like uh, being on your show, just uh, what was it a week, a week and a half ago, you know, like I've just had such a response from that because you yeah. have such a big following and you have such a big following because you do an amazing job and you're funny. And uh, I could learn a bit on the funny side, I think. Yeah, would, could you, would could you work on that a bit? Yeah, I'm a bit serious. Hell, you need to lift I'm, your game. I'm really too serious. <laughs> well, I like you know to be thinky. <laughs> you know what I think is that I always think, like if I'm going to go talk to an audience and this, my, and all I've got is information and data and facts, I'm not going to create a whole lot of connection. Mm. But if there's stories and a bit of humour as well as some quality information, if you can create an emotional connection with people, then the teaching and the sharing of thoughts and ideas is much easier. You know, and I don't set out to get a laugh or, but you know, it's like, I know if I sit and listen to a speaker who to me, that person, he or she is engaging, I'm in. But if I, I listen to someone who's got three PhDs and a fucking Nobel prize, but they're boring, I'm out. It doesn't matter. I'm like, fuck, dude, come on. Like, I'm nodding off. You know, it's like, because you, you want to, I mean, ultimately, we're still emotional, social creatures, and we want to be a bit amused and entertained. And we want to connect with the person who's in front of us. And that's a good, you know, a good teacher that can bring across the passion. And the, if that's through humor, if that's through just a really engaging style, then then mm. that's fantastic. Mm. Hey, Craig, I know you've got to get to another appointment and I've really taken up a lot of your time today, but I just want to thank you. And I, 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 I can't wait to do a few more things with you. I don't know what, and we're in COVID and all that sort of jazz. I can't pop over and see you. I'd love to. Um, but I hope we can do some more stuff together. I think what you're doing is fabulous. Your PhD sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, and yeah, I've got to go and read your books now. So we, we actually better. on that point, tell we us better. where people can find you, your books and all of that sort of good jazz. Um, jazz. Probably just uh, so where to look at lots of stuff would just be craigharper.net. Mm-hmm. Um, where to probably, I mean, probably the easiest access just to follow my day-to-day stuff is um, Instagram, which is at whiteboard lessons whiteboard lessons yep at whiteboard lessons because i do a lot of i write I shared on the whiteboard. one of them today it was good i saw that thank you i i, I incessantly write on whiteboards <laughs> um and then i take pictures of what i write and post it which people seem to resonate with yeah, yeah so just instagram um at, at whiteboard lessons social media uh sorry and Facebook the you podcast like oh, the you project and of course the you 
project, fucking project, 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 the project. project. Um, <laughs> the you project or the you project <laughs> is my podcast. So yeah, it's been great, Lisa, and I love what you do, and I think you're ace. And um, I didn't know of you a couple of months ago, and I'm very impressed. And I'm it's it's a privilege to come on your show, and it's great to meet you. And I'm looking forward to hanging out with you one day. Absolutely. We'll absolutely do that. You can teach me to do some better chin-ups because I'm not very good at them. Well, we're definitely not <laughs> going for a run. I'll give you that tip. <laughs> oh, man, I'm not so long. I don't do so long anymore. So you'd be actually fine with me running. <laughs> All right. All right, matey. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, we look forward to having you on again at some stage. Perfect. Thanks, Lise. Thanks, everyone. Take care.